Hi, and welcome to the Church of RB Online. We are so grateful to have you here with us, and we can't wait to get started. Today, Pastor Jared has a great message for us in our Raise Your Voice series. We're going to go into a few moments of worship and then be right back with a few things we want you to know about.
Hey, everybody. So good to see you. Let's thank Ethan and let's thank DJ and let's thank Sydney for leading us strong today. Yeah. Uh, you guys can have a seat. I uh, need to give you staff updates. And uh, there are certain moments in the life of the church that are easier than others. And this is certainly not easy for me as we uh, proved at the 8.30 service this morning. Uh, several weeks ago, I walked into Nate Alcorn's office. Uh, if you're new with us, this is Nate Alcorn. And uh, he, uh, he asked me to, to sit down and he shared with me something that I want to share with you today. And that's that although his love and his commitment to this church and, and you uh, has not changed, his opinion has not changed of you and of this church, his assignment and kingdom work has changed and that he would be transitioning off of our staff after nine years and taking a role uh, closer to his home in Encinitas, a church where his daughters go to preschool and is in his backyard uh, where he lives. And uh, I wanted uh, just to take a moment for us as a church to celebrate Nate. I know you love Nate as much as I do. And so I wanted to let you know, but I also wanted you to hear from Nate. And Nate, how can we be praying for you and Sarah and the girls in this yeah. transition? Thanks, man. Well, I mean, it's with a heavy heart that we, we share that news. There's mixed emotions going on inside my heart and my soul. And uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve here at this church for the last nine years and getting to know so many of you, working alongside you. I mean, I think it's an understatement to say that this community knows who Jesus is uh, because of you and the work that you've done. I mean, we've met real physical needs in the community. We've built incredible relationships and partnerships with schools and city leaders and nonprofit organizations. And this community knows the love and the grace of Jesus because of you. And, and your work. And so I know that work is not done. God's got a lot more in store for you. And I can't wait to see that and, and just watch what God continues to do. Um, but uh, yeah, this is God's will, best will for our life. It's, it's, again, it's with tension and sadness, but it's also with expectancy that I'm excited to see what God is doing in and through our family uh, as we move on. So it's not a goodbye, uh, but it is, a, it is a transition. So we want to let you guys know that this morning. Yeah. Nate, on behalf of our staff and our church, I, uh, I want to give you this gift card to the Rancho Bernardo Inn. I see what you're doing, man. That's good. Yeah. Sneaky, sneaky guy here. DJ said Reb Robin gift cards, and I said no. Okay. Hey, no. That's DJ a little blow. DJ loves me so much. Uh, I attempted this at the 8.30 service. Nate, I, I told you this, this is our second time to do this this morning. Yeah. I told you that I sat down and wrote you a letter this week, and I read it to Rosanna, and I was going to give it to you on your way out, and she said, no, you need to read that to the, to the church. <laughs> and I said, well, babe, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> and I, I read it at 8.30, and it was a terrible idea because <laughs> I sobbed the whole way through it. So I've done this once, so hopefully we'll I can get through this, but I think this is how we all feel about you. Nate? When you came on staff at this church nine years ago, you were in your 20s, you had never worked in a church, and you were not a father. Today, we celebrate you because you have changed, you have matured, you've grown in wisdom and favor with God and man. And while it's probably easy for you to think about all the ways that you have changed and your family has changed over the last nine years, I imagine it isn't as easy to think about all the ways that you have changed us. As a church, you have changed us to become good neighbors. You have reminded us again and again of God's call in our lives to be the Good Samaritan, to love the hurting, and through your leadership, we have experienced a taste of what it looks like when heaven comes to earth. I say thank you today on behalf of myself, our staff, our church, but I also say thank you today on behalf of the thousands of men, women, and children today who perhaps you've never met, but you've changed their life too. I say thank you on behalf of the survivors of human trafficking that you fought for, I say thank you on behalf of the children in this city who went to bed hungry but don't anymore. I say thank you on behalf of the homeless that you fought for, the mouths that you have fed, and the hours that you have poured into what matters most. Over the last nine years, you've directed thousands of people and millions of dollars to impact the kingdom of God. For that today, we say thank you for changing us. Nate, my personal definition of success is that the closer you get to someone, the more you like them. If that's true, then I hope you hear Jesus say over you today, well done, my good and faithful servant, because all of us who know you like you a lot, and we will miss not just your heart, but your personality. Thank you for running this leg of your race so well. You will always have fans and friends cheering you on from Rancho Bernardo, 
and I know there will be a piece of this church in your heart as you go. We love you, Nate. I got through it. I got through it. No, you gotta, you gotta stay standing, okay? You gotta stay standing. I need, I need you to make him feel as awkward as you can. All right, thank you. Uh, hey, let's all just stand, extend a hand in Nate's direction. I'm gonna pray for you, and we're gonna continue to pray for you. And it's with a heavy heart that we lift you up and we send you out of here today, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life and the legacy of Nate and what he's done here over nine years. We are all different because of his leadership. People who've only been at this church for a matter of months are different because of his leadership. We love you more because of his leadership. And today we lift up Sarah, we lift up the girls, we lift up Nate. And we know that although they go closer to home, uh, we know that there is a part of this place that is home as well. And so it's with a heavy heart that we offer this moment to you, God. And we say, cover our brother. And wherever he goes and whatever he does, he's got a crew of people here cheering him on. And we know the best days are to come for him and for our church. And it's in Jesus' name we lift him up to you and we say thanks. In Jesus' name, all of God's children said, amen. 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 You can remain standing, remain standing. Uh, We're going to continue to worship together. I did that better at 8.30 than 10 You nailed it this time, man. All right. Welcome back. Thank you again for making this church service a part of your day. We say this all the time, and I'm going to say it again because it just feels right. We are a good neighbor church. That means we do life with people in circles and for people out in our communities and neighborhoods. Here are a few ways for you to engage with the church body to become good neighbors here in San Diego. Coming up August 5th through 7th, we'll be having a Good Neighbor Weekend with tons of projects for you and your family. We've got one special project close to our hearts this time, and here is Dr. Mark Strauss to tell you all about it. Hi, I'm Mark Strauss, co-teacher at the Good Book Bible Study at the Church at Rancho Bernardo. And we're here at the future site of Pacific Theological Seminary, a place God is raising up to train men and women for theological leadership here in San Diego. We hope you'll join us here August 7th to help us paint as we prepare this place for God's glory here in San Diego. I look forward to seeing you here August 7th for Good Neighbor Weekend. Doesn't that sound amazing? Go to our website to sign up now for Good Neighbor Weekend and call your friends and get them there too. Our next Preparing for Retirement seminar is tomorrow, July 26th. It's going to be a good one with lots of great information for people with aging parents, so you're not going to want to miss it. Registration is required, so please sign up on our website. We know that forming habits and keeping rhythms can be hard, but it is so helpful to developing a deep and meaningful faith. Two things we've got for your family to help you. One, our daily devotionals to read every morning. Find them online or text the number below to get them delivered to you. And two, for the kids every Tuesday night at 6.30, we've got youth night right here at the church. No sign up is required. Just drop them off for a good time of fun and growth. Giving to the church is about much more than just a financial transaction. The Church at RB wants to see God grow in you a spirit of generosity that spills out in all areas of your life. Giving to the mission of His church is really an act of worship, one that develops your relationship with Him and leads you to so much more of what He has in store for you. If you're in a position to give, visit crb.gives today. In just a minute, we'll be back with Pastor Jared in the Worship Center. Enjoy.
keep doing that. That's my bad. My flux capacitor is broken, but I fixed it. Uh, so good to see you, 10 o'clock. How you doing? How you feeling? Good to see you. Hope your summer is cruising along well. Uh, we're going to have some church today, okay? We're going to have some church. Um, I like you. Uh, the, uh, the, the heart of this series that we've been in for the last several weeks has been how do you as an individual uh, raise your voice in life? And that plays itself out in a lot of ways. But specifically today, uh, I want to talk about in terms of prayer, how do you raise your voice as a person that prays? And uh, even if you're not a Christian, here's one thing I know about you. Over the course of the last 18 months, you have prayed more than you have ever prayed, haven't you? Uh, some of you, you're not even a Christian. In fact, you would tell people I'm an atheist, but you've just tried it. I mean, just be honest, I mean, you've tried prayer because my goodness, with everything that's going on in the world. And so today I specifically want to talk about as, as Christ followers, uh, when we pray, we pray two specific ways, or there's two things that we kind of bookend our prayers with. The first is we say, God, our Father. Jesus says, hey, I want you to pray our Father in heaven. And what does that mean? And how does that not just tell God how we think of him, but how does it tell us who we are? And on the other side of it, when the prayer is over, I mean, you learn this in vacation Bible school, perhaps, you pray in Jesus' name. And there's a reason we pray in Jesus' name, and that unlocks something for us as Christ followers. And I want to talk specifically today about how we pray and raise our voice uh, through, through the act of prayer. Uh, before I do, I want to tell you a story from a couple weeks ago. It was about three or four weeks ago. Uh, Rosanna, my wife, is a part of a fitness community in town called Forward Fitness. And uh, some of you know of Forward Fitness. And let me just say this uh, for free, whether it's restaurants or local gyms, can we all just agree to support our brothers and sisters who are running businesses right now? Uh, yes. Some of you uh, I've talked to you, you run fitness studios, you run restaurants, and these have been a long 18 months, and uh, we want to do everything as a church that we can to support you. And uh, fitness, uh, Forward Fitness is a, uh, it's a predominantly a female uh, fitness studio here in Rancho Bernardo that Rosanna's been a part of for the last six years or so. And uh, she came home one day and she said, honey, uh, Forward is doing a, a couple's date night I'll pulse here for laughter. Uh, and I'd love for you to come and be a part of this uh, with me. And uh, so I said, uh, uh, sure, honey, uh, what exactly are we going to be doing? And she said, well, there's a 45-minute a workout. And I said, well, what kind of workout uh, do you mean? And she said, uh, well, it's, it's, it's functional movement. And uh, the short version of the story is Rosanna and I have very different ideas about what constitutes a date night, and we have very different ideas about what constitutes functional movement. Uh, functional movement, as far as I'm concerned, is open the laptop, open the laptop, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, Netflix. Uh, uh, and, but, you know, being a good husband, I said, sure, uh, I'm, I'm in, uh, let's go. And uh, the first thing I did was I phoned a friend, which if you're a guy in this position, this is what you should do as well. Uh, I called my friend Cameron, uh, who, Sydney, who just led us in worship. Uh, Cameron and Sydney came uh, to the date night with us. And I was like, dude, I I'm sweating bullets like two weeks out in anxiety over this date night. And I need you to come with me. And so they agreed, they came. And on our way in, Rosanna hands me two three pound weights. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, what am I going to do with these? Like, what is this? Is this part of the, like, what, what is this? And let me just tell you, men and women, over the course of 45 minutes, those are torture devices. <laughs> and I, I've got these little weights in my hand. We get there and, and I am, uh, Rosanna stakes out our place on the front row, which just for free today, if you ever find yourself in this situation and you have never done a functional movement workout, do not get on the front row. All of my awkwardness is on display. I am five feet from the instructor, and she's incredible, by the way. She's awesome at what she does, uh, but the problem is I'm not awesome at this. I am not good at what we're going to do. I'm not incredible. And we start going, and it is like one, two, three, four, and I'm lost. I don't know. I'm kind of looking around, all these other guys who are like CrossFitters and F45ers. I, they're like, whoa, what? And all of a sudden, we're in the middle of this thing, and we're, I, I'm starting to get the hang of it as we we go, and I'm, I'm starting to get more, the, the pain's just increasing as we go. 
And at one point in this workout, I'm on all fours and I've got this two pound weight behind my knee and I'm kicking it up like a dog peeing on a hydrant. <laughs> and it's like this one, two, three, four, I can't feel my butt anymore. One, two, three. And I am like, crying and I look across the field at my friend Cameron who screams back at me I have negative butt muscles is what he says <laughs> and I scream back at him this is not functional movement <laughs> and I am in tears by the time this thing is over it ended up being an awesome date night the whole thing was incredible uh, but I'm telling you uh, do not take that lightly if you ever get invited to that some of you have wondered where I've been for the last two weeks I've been at Pomerado Hospital recovering <laughs> from that workout. Blood transfusions and massage therapists just to get me back on stage today. So uh, I, I say that because I think at times when you become a Christian, when you sign up to follow Jesus, uh, you say, great, I, I, I'm in. Uh, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do? And somebody will say, okay, well, you're supposed to read the scriptures. You're supposed to go to church. You're supposed to pray. And if I have a problem, what do I do? Well, you pray. You, you go talk to God. And somewhere along the way, isn't it true in prayer, you start going, this is not functional movement. Uh, how is it that to solve my problems, I'm supposed to close my eyes and talk to somebody who does not have skin on? And prayer can feel like, you know, one, two, three, what are we doing? How is there any kind of benefit to this? And what I want for you and what I want for me and what I want for our church is that we be uh, deeply formed, spirit-led people who show up to pray again and again. And it's not once, but it's the thousand times of prayer that it begins to form and shape who we are. And over time in our faith, that it would become functional movement for us to be people who pray and go to the Father again and again. And there's a power when we pray to the Father, and there's a power when we pray in Jesus' name. And that's not just functional movement because it's what we're supposed to do. Those two phrases, Father in Jesus' name, Father in Jesus' name, it's unlocking something for us. There's a power to that. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to open it today to Galatians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, uh, that's okay. We're going to put these verses on the screen. And this is a passage of Scripture that on the surface, when you read it, you go, well, that doesn't really have anything to do with prayer. But it has everything to do with prayer because it sets the stage for how we are to relate to God as our father and why God says, I want you to come to me when you're burdened. I want you to cast your, uh, your yoke upon me. I want you to, to, to enter into relationship with me. I want you to, to know me because I'm father. And he tells you in this passage, the power of that and why we pray in Jesus' name. And so he says this, this is a guy named Paul, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 26, and we're going to work our way uh, through, four, uh, through chapter 4. Uh, not the whole chapter, just in case you're, you're worried. You're like, man, this is going to be long. Uh, yeah. uh, go ahead and lock the door, security. That would be fantastic. Uh, it says this. This is Paul. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. That's who you are today. You're a child of God. And that right there, I'm like, okay, sold. I, I don't need to know anything else, but he keeps going. He says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. He says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. This is a famous passage of scripture. Uh, there's neither slave nor free. And so what he's saying is through Christ, through the resurrection of Christ, a, a new humanity has been launched. Your economic status is not what's first and most primary about your life. Your racial background is not what's primary about your life. All that's uh, laid out, the, the, the ground is level at the cross. To the extent, he says, there's neither male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. You're all God's kids. If you belong to Christ, he says, then you are Abraham's seed. Well, what is that about? And heirs according to the promise, this promise that God had made through Abraham. He says, you're recipients of the power of that promise. And it's not just five minutes old or 20 years old when you became a Christian. It's thousands and thousands of years old that God has promised something to you and your heirs. And he goes on, and I love this, and we're going to come back to this. He says, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he's no different from a slave. And I'm going to explain this in just a moment. He says, although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. 
So also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. And that's a powerful phrase. If you have a Bible, underline it, circle it, get a tattoo on your forehead, whatever you got to do, adopted to sonship, to daughtership, a child of God. Don't forget the power of that. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit the Holy Spirit of his son, Jesus Christ, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, cries out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but you are God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. There's a power to that. And as you read that today, I hope it moves you in your spirit to see what God has given you access to. Because I think for all of us today, whether you're Christian or not, you, you hear that at a certain level or you, somebody says, well, you should pray about that. And you go, well, why? Because God cares and you're one of his kids. And, and, and I think as Christ followers, you go, well, how am I any different than anybody else? I mean, aren't we all kind of God's kids down here on planet earth? Why does he care about me more than he cares about somebody else? Or why is he listening to my prayers as much or if more or not more than somebody else? What does it mean to be one of God's kids? Well, listen, when you pray, you are not just one of God's kids in some kind of generic sense. You are what Paul says is deeper than that. You are not just a child of God. You are an heir of God. And those are fundamentally different relationships. And when you pray, you don't just pray as a child. You pray as an heir because you have been adopted by God. You're an heir. And that's a different kind of relationship. For many of you, if I were to ask you your life story, or I've asked you your life story before, and you have told me uh, your background, and you would say, you know, uh, Jack is my biological father, but he didn't raise me. I don't even call him father. I call him Jack. And uh, John, John is my father, although he is not my biological father. He's my father. He's the one I call Abba. He's the one who raised me. And he's the one, I'm his heir. I, I have his values have been imparted to me. Uh, one day when he dies, his valuables will be imparted to me. I, I have a kind of relationship with, that's different than just my, than I have with my biological father, although I'm his offspring. And that's essentially what it means when you are a Christ follower. Through faith, you have become an heir. The values of God have been imparted to you and the valuables of God and the kingdom of God, the creator of all things, have been entrusted and imparted to you. And so when you pray, you go to the Father, not just uh, randomly, like, hey, I'm talking to you like everybody talks to you. No, I'm coming to you today, Father, uh, on bended knee, uh, because I, I'm, I'm an heir. I'm, I'm one, of your, uh, one of your heirs. I have a proximity to you that's different than, than just anybody in the world because through Christ, I'm an heir. And so Paul doubles down on this again and again. He says it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. He says, now if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You catch the power of that. You're a co-heir with Christ today. Which means that whatever has been promised to Christ has been promised to you. And you go, well, I didn't earn that. No, Christ has earned that on your behalf, that you have benefited in such an extraordinary way through what Christ has done for you and what he's done through the cross and what he's done through resurrection, that you are a co-heir with Christ, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The, the, the promise of future benefit that's given to Christ is given to you. And there's an eager expectation of that, of what's to come, which is why Paul says this in the, in the next part. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. And what is he saying there? That there is a, a present benefit to being a Christ follower, but there is a future benefit, which is our hope, which is the, 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 the grand majesty of our faith, isn't it? That one day when you die, there is an inheritance that comes in your direction. And you should live your life, you should pray in such a way that you have an eager expectation of that, uh, that in the same way, you know, this is maybe I shouldn't say this, but if you had a rich uncle and, okay, say you don't know this rich uncle and say he 
lives in France and you, you just found out he was rich, okay? So we'll kind of make this not personal. Uh, and then you found out he died and that $100 million was being given to you. Be honest, there'd be a part of you that would, you know, kind of eagerly expect, well, when's that money going to come? I'm so sorry he died. When's that money going to come? Uh, <laughs> that you pray in the same way. You show up to pray in such a way that there's an eager expectation of a benefit, a glory that will be revealed, uh, an inheritance that will come in your direction. But it's not just future tense, it's present tense. It's not just one day when you die, it's in this life. Because what's the picture that he gives again and again? He says, you've been adopted to sonship adopted to daughtership. God has adopted you. He he says this again and again throughout the New Testament, Ephesians. uh, You were adopted into this family. And if you're adopted, many of you, you understand this far better than I do because you were adopted or you have adopted a child. And you know that if you're a baby and you're adopted or you're 15 and you're adopted, does not matter who your biological parents are. The moment you're adopted to that family, if your father and mother are wealthy, all of a sudden, what, what does that mean for you? When you're adopted, you're wealthy. Uh, you're an heir of, in future tense, but also in present tense, there is something that is available to you because your legal status has changed. You have a new identity, a new inheritance that has been given to you. And so when you pray, you and I aren't just down here praying going, well, you know, Father, uh, blah, 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 uh, in, in Jesus' name, you know, because that's functional movement. And that's what we're supposed to do. No, we, we pray in such a way that we unlock a power as the adopted sons and daughters of God. And we're coming to him in that moment saying, Father, and that's a key that's unlocking a door. In Jesus' name, that's a key that's unlocking a door. I'm saying in that moment, an identity and an inheritance is mine. And I'm asking for access to that right now, Father. And I'm coming to you. Some of you understand this far better than I do. Uh, I understand it at a certain level because when I was in college, both of my parents uh, got married uh, to other people. I should say they're divorced, uh, but uh, they got married. And both of my parents, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, married prominent people in our city. Uh, My mom got married to, who's my stepfather to this very day, uh, Mike Waldron is his name. And Mike, uh, he, uh, when my parent, when my mom married Mike, He was the executive director, uh, the president of the Georgia Golf Association. And that meant that, uh, and he's been in, you know, he's part of the Georgia Golf Hall of Fame in the golf world. He's kind of a big deal. And I grew up in a family, I did not know how to spell golf. (laughs) You're laughing, but I'm from Georgia. Uh, And... Within a few short years, there I was standing on the 18th hole at the Masters, and I'm meeting his golf friends, and he's giving speeches, and I'm like, man, I don't, I don't, I played top golf a few times, I don't know, and and it wasn't because of anything I did, it was because of my proximity and my relationship to Mike, and because he adopted me essentially as family that I now had access to a world that I never had access to before. And that is, a, that is what your relationship with Christ is like, and that's how you should pray. Something's available to you that was not available to you before because of who has adopted you. My, uh, my dad uh, married, uh, is married to a prominent judge uh, in the city of Atlanta. And uh, my brother and I are still not quite sure how he pulled this off, but we... Uh, <laughs> We, we love you, Dad. Uh, but uh, my, my, uh, my stepmom is an amazing woman. And uh, she was the first black judge appointed to the bench in DeKalb Superior Court, which is a big deal in Atlanta. Yeah, uh, it's worth applauding. Still on the bench to this very day. Amazing woman. And when I was in college, uh, she, she, uh, she, I was at the University of Georgia, and she came for a conference to the University of Georgia. And it was all these legal what to do's in the state. And she said, hey, why don't you come meet me for lunch with all, you know, kind of these these big wigs. And I show up with my book bag and I sit down at the table and I'm like, you know, making small talk with the first guy. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a speech major. Woo. And I'm talking with people and the guy next to me, I'm asking him like, so what do you do? And he's like, well, I'm the governor of the state for crying out loud. (laughs) 
And I'm like, ooh, uh, which state? Uh, and literally the next line of my, my, out of my mouth is like, oh, well, thank you for signing my driver's license, bro. Like, uh, I did not get invited to any other lunches after that. But through my own network and power and charisma, I was not getting invited to these lunches through my relationship with her because she had adopted me and treats me to this very day like her child. I have access to something that I didn't have access to before. And that's what Jesus Christ has done for you. You have been adopted by a father with a whole other set of connections and networks and power. And he says, through Christ, it is yours. It's yours. You pray that way. You pray that way. And I, I love this. You keep going in this passage. He says, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he's no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, this is you and me, those under the law. And this is a weird passage. What am I saying? I'm saying that an heir who's underage, you're like, what, what is that? Like, I can't buy cigarettes in the kingdom of God. What, like, what is going on? What Paul's doing here is he's telling you two critical questions for people in the first century is how do I get my identity and how do I get my inheritance? And I would argue those are still critical questions in the 21st century world. We're just a little more polite about it than they used to be. But how do I get my identity and how do I get my inheritance? If you were a child in the first century world and it did not matter how prominent or powerful or wealthy your father was, you had no access to his, his network, his power, his land until a set time had come and he was the one who established it or until he died. And you would live in his house as a, as a servant or as a slave. Uh, on the other side of it, if you were a slave in the first century world, you had no identity and you had no inheritance, even though you'd worked and you'd earned in this house, laboring and laboring and laboring, uh, you were just property. And Paul here is mixing metaphors about two people that everybody would understand had no identity, had no inheritance, that, that through Christ, you have gained an identity and an inheritance. And he uses this word here that is so powerful. We read over it and you've heard this word so many times. It's kind of like white noise, but this word redeem. And to redeem something, you know, you hear that, you go, you redeem a coupon, I'm redeemed, what's the big deal? To be redeemed, it's a first century slave culture word. And when you would redeem a slave, what you were doing essentially as the landowner, you were paying a price in full for that slave to be set free. And Paul says, that's what Christ has done for you. You have been set free. You have now gained not just an identity, but an inheritance. And with your freedom, go live, go pray, go access the power of God that's available to you in your life. And when you pray to God the Father, that's saying, I have an identity as a son or a daughter. And when you pray in Jesus' name, that's saying, I have an inheritance that Christ has made available to me as a co-heir. And the identity and inheritance comes through what Christ has done on our behalf. And I would argue in our culture, identity and inheritance are still a big deal uh, for you and for me. It looks different and it's depending on the family you're in, depending on the culture you were raised in, uh, especially in terms of identity. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how do I gain my identity? If you grow up in, a, in an Eastern culture or most traditional societies throughout the history of the world have operated this way, but in a traditional society, how you gain your identity or your inheritance is you perform the role that society says, this is what you're supposed to do. As a son, as an employee, don't bring shame. Do not mess up. You just perform the role you're supposed to perform. And so in that kind of culture, and some of you, you know this firsthand, there is a crushing guilt if you step outside of the bounds of what you're supposed to do and you lose your identity, you lose your inheritance. In a Western culture like ours and in Western societies, you gain your identity 
through not, not through going to the culture and saying, tell me what I'm supposed to do, what role do I play? You determine in your heart who you are and you're ruggedly individualistic and you go out to society and say, this is who I am and this is what I'm worth and this is, you know, I, you know I'm gonna be this rugged individual. And so consequently in a society like ours, this is why you're constantly racked with anxiety because whether it's your job, whether it's how you look, whatever it may be, your identity rises and falls with how well people view you, how well you've sort of performed the role that you told everybody that you are. And there's a crushing anxiety that comes with that. And when we pray, God, Father, uh, in Jesus' name, essentially there's a power. We're being scripted in that moment where all of a sudden, when we pray that way, we're saying, God, I don't have to live under the crushing burden of guilt to prove who I am. I don't have to live under the crushing burden of anxiety where it's on me to determine who I am. When I pray, God, the Father, I am saying, I know who I am, and it's your child, it's your daughter, it's your son as a child of God. And I'm not going out trying to prove that. Whew, I have that. Father, Father. And that's mine. I get access to that today. There's a power. And I lay hold of that. And in Jesus' name, I know, God, I already have my inheritance as a child of God. And when I'm down here on planet Earth and I'm looking at my circumstances at work or my circumstances financially, and I'm like, oh, one, two, three, four. I'm, I'm going to pray like never before. Uh, it's not just functional movement. I'm actually accessing and raising my voice, a power in that moment that Paul says has been given to you. And we often think when we pray about the forces that are coming against us in life, which is part of this. He says, you, you used to live under the elemental spiritual forces of the world, and obviously that's still there. You have an enemy who's constantly coming against you in this life. But when you pray, God our Father, in Jesus' name, don't just think about what's coming against you. Think about the headwinds, not just in front of you, but the tailwinds that are behind you, the, the spirit of God that's propelling you. Uh, how many of us have ever heard of uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear? Uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear uh, was a war fought in the 1730s between Spain and England. And you can look this up. Uh, historians call it the War of Jenkins' Ear because in the 1730s, Robert Jenkins, a naval captain for the British, was sailing off the coast of Florida and a, uh, a Spanish uh, soldier boarded his boat, uh, seized the boat, cut his ear off, and instead of killing him, said, I want you to take your ear back to your king. You gotta love the 1730s, man. And said, I want you to take your ear back to your king and tell him this is what we're gonna do to the British. And so Jenkins takes his ear and he goes back to parliament and he goes back to the king. He's like, uh, we got a problem. They said, what do you want us to do? He said, I can't hear you. What? I, I, don't, I don't know what he said. But he, he takes the ear and, and England goes to war with Spain for nine years because they essentially said, if you mess with one of us, you've messed with the whole crown. And now all the resources of the crown are coming down, going to rain down on Spain because you cut off one guy's ear. And God says to you as my child, when they've messed with you, when the enemy's messing with you, all the resources of the crown are going to rain down on your enemy. Because you are my child and you've accessed the power as a son, as a daughter in Jesus' name. And so you live that way, you pray that way, you start to function that way, you start to look at your problems through that lens, and all of a sudden that power is a tailwind. You go, oh, I got the power of the crown at my disposal, pushing and propelling me forward in life. And he goes on and he says this, I, I love this part. There's, there's so much power here because you've prayed this a thousand times in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Well, why do we pray that? He says, the time when the, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Now, because of Christ sent into the world, you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Are you, are you kidding me? I have, I have that kind of power? 
And so you pray in Jesus' name. And when you say that, it's not just like a flippant, like, yeah, here we go. It, it's, it's a power of phrase in Jesus' name. You're accessing something in that moment. You're saying, I'm not showing up today in my name because I don't deserve it. I'm showing up in his name, his beautiful name, because he deserves it and he's earned it. In my house right now, I have three boys, uh, nine, seven, and Ezra, our youngest, will be five this week. And my kids are uh, unfortunately very, very smart. And you you know what I mean by that? They're very good at manipulating me and one another. And uh, I I lately, uh, my nine-year-old, He's, uh, he's, he's learned that he, uh, throughout the course of a day, he can use up his asks for things. And, and mom and dad get kind of worn out. And we're like, man, you can't ask for anything else. And, you know, the day starts off and he's like, uh, can I have a Hot Wheel? Can I have whatever it is? And by four o'clock, we're like, man, you got to stop asking for stuff. And so what he's learned to do is he goes to his five-year-old brother, Ezra, who is kind of like the... The, the angel, right? Because he's five and he hasn't learned how to manipulate yet. And he knows Ezra is, you know, got mom and dad wrapped around his finger. And so he'll go in Ezra's bedroom and I'll hear him say, Ezra, I want you to go ask for a Hot Wheel, but I don't want you to tell mom and dad that it's me asking. Ask for you. Ask for you. What is he doing in that moment? He's going, I want you to go ask in the beautiful name of Ezra. (laughs) Not because I deserve it, but because you deserve it. And what happens? Nine times out of 10, he gets the hot wheel. Um, (laughs) Jesus says, I want you to pray that way. Not in your name, but in my name. Not because you deserve it, but because I deserve it. You're a co-heir with me. And so you show up. You, you know what happened at the cross? Uh, you remember the passage of scripture where Jesus is hanging on the cross and Jesus has earned the full rights as a son. He is the son of God. And on the cross, he deserves the full estate of his father in heaven. And on the cross, he's crying out, Abba, Father, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, he'd lost his sonship. He'd been stripped of his rights as a son. And at the cross, through the empty tomb of Jesus, Jesus lost his rights as a son so that you could gain your rights as the son and the daughter of God. That's the gospel. It's the power of that. And so when you step into prayer, you're living out the gospel. When you say in Jesus' name, you're living out the gospel. You're reminding yourself of the crux of your faith, not because I've earned it, but because Jesus has earned it. He was stripped of his rights as a child of God so you could gain your rights as a child of God. And I don't know how often you pray. I don't know if it's for five minutes or five hours, depending on what's going on in your life. But when you bookend your prayers with Father in Jesus' name, Father in Jesus' name, whatever is in between those two things, something powerful is happening in that moment. And I pray this week when you hit bended knee, I pray you'd be deeply formed, you'd be spirit-led in your life, whatever you head to on Monday or Thursday of this week. But I pray you go as a praying man, as a praying woman, knowing you have access to a power through the Father in Jesus' name. And when you pray that, Father, you know what's happening in that moment? When you pray, Father, what you're essentially saying in that moment is, God, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, this has been true for me time and time again, that I close my eyes and I sit down and I begin, Father. And right there, I'm speechless. Father. Because what comes next is not me telling God what I want. What comes next after me saying, Father, is God reminding me of who I am a child of God. And when you say, Father, that's the power of prayer right there. And when you say, in Jesus' name, you're not telling God what you think you deserve. You're telling God what Jesus has earned on your behalf and what you think you want to want to lay hold of in this life and what you want to access in this life because it's inheritance. And all of a sudden through praying, the the power of prayer is identity and inheritance has come to you through raising your voice as an heir again. And again, I hope you pray powerful prayers in your life, man. 
if you prayed big, beautiful prayers. And we wouldn't just be people who go, well, we gotta pray because uh, one, two, three, four. I'm unlocking something. And God wants to give you something as a child, as an heir. Would you pray that way this week? Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. Just cry that out. Let that be the cry of your heart this week as you go through your life, whatever you're facing. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. And you've accessed something just through those two phrases. Let's pray together today. Father, Father, we come to you. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We come to you today, God, on bended knee, lifting our hearts. All of us come through the fire of the last 18 months. Some of us smelling like smoke. Some of us burned a little bit. Some of us with our eyebrows singed. But we come to you today saying, Father, hold us, carry us. We look at the challenges of this week. We don't know what to do. Father, we look at our daughter who's walked away from you. We don't know what to do. Father, we look at our circumstances in life and we go, I don't know what to do about this, God. Father, we look at that employee and we're not quite sure what's going on. Father, we look at the circumstances and our parents' health and we don't know what to do. Father, and it unlocks a power as the children of God, would we access, would we lay hold of that today, God? In Jesus' name, would we know that something comes to us as the co-heirs of Christ? And when we say in Jesus' name, would we not just think about what we're wanting in that moment, but would we think about who we are and the inheritance that has been entrusted and gifted to us? And the power of prayer is that we're the co-heirs of Christ in Jesus' name. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. Grace and peace, my brothers and sisters.
spread.